difference. You have menus. I just had to use this one. Some of them are very cartoony and show you what they'll look like after you have an omelet. But if you notice, it has special magic mushroom soup or omelet, 100 baht, which is $4. If you're in the field, the rice paddy farmers and cattle tenders will sell you a two or three ounces for the same amount of money. And you never know if you're getting a, a real magic mushroom omelet unless you know the, the restaurant and the people running it or if it's an LSD-laced omelet which occurs once in a while on the islands when the mushrooms are not in season. <laughs> this is a deluxe omelet. It's upside down here. Uh, it's got tomatoes and uh, cucumbers around and a mushroom cap in the center. And you can see the little dark spots of the mushrooms in it. It was a real omelet. And uh, some omelets were very burnt and you didn't want to eat them after you looked at them. This is a magic mushroom farm. You have magic mushrooms, which was quite common in the islands a, a while back. They're illegal there now, but it hasn't deterred anybody from making an extra bot. Uh, nobody seems to be prosecuted for it. One sign read, we have rooms, we have shrooms. <laughs> in Bali also, this is a morning uh, picked by a couple natives who approached me in the field, and I threw my little uh, ruler in there to, to show size for scientific purposes. And uh, some mushroom t-shirts from Koh Samui, which are very popular. They're uh, one of many different handicraft items uh, catering to tourist in influence on their cultures. And that, uh, this one came out sideways. This is a uh, title on the bottom, same, same, but different, which is a Thai expression. They'll show the pop, the mushroom, the Buddha, and opium poppies. And basically, they're saying the effects are all similar each other. This is a batik from Bali, uh, 24 by 36 inches, uh, made of silk and uh, wax and mushrooms, and the girl obviously has a ganja stick there in her fingers. Uh, temptation of Eve, maybe, there's a snake, a Thai version or a Thai interpretation, or Bali interpretation. <laughs> Most of very fun. Some are cartoony, some are very, uh, the art is, is fantastic. I have over 500 slides of different uh, t-shirts that I originally purchased a few years back and they were sold out instantly. <laughs> and uh, Magic Mushroom Coast and Louis Fun. <clears throat> and that's it. Wow. That's the end of the uh, slide page. So if you have a panel discussion, so Psychological slides, so everyone knows what's happening in Southern California. Certainly. Thank you. You want to? No, it's fine. No, it's still just. Thank you. That's all right. Was approached by one of his constituents, a woman. Whose son had uh, bioassays and psychoactive mushrooms and had the misfortune to be caught in the mushroom state and put through the health care and delivery system. And it created a panic in Fresno. And his mother was outraged and she approached Senator Batty, who then wrote a bill making spores or seeds of any substance that could produce a psychoactive plant or mushroom illegal. Uh, as far as I know, California remains the only state in the union where possession of, of psychedelic mushroom spores, even though they contain no psychedelic substance, is illegal. So when you <coughs> write to some of these uh, mail order sources for, or for psychedelic mushroom spores, you usually almost certainly will get back a note saying we cannot send them into California. Of course, we all know that every state in the union also has them uh, in the category of a felony for possession or cultivation, and the same thing applies on a federal level. With that in mind, I'd like to pose a question to our panel. Supposedly, supposing we, we all got up tomorrow morning and opened our LA Times or our Orange County Register and we saw a story that said mushroom, psych psychoactive mushrooms decriminalized. And in fact, you could then cultivate, collect in the wild or bioassay mushrooms without any fear of penalty. So my question to the panel is, what benefit to society might this have if we were all free to use them 
when and where we chose. Can we start with John? Well, I don't generally like to speculate about the future of um, these things, but um, <coughs> hypothetically speaking, I would say I believe that what these entheogenic substances, what I call entheogenic substances, what some people call psychedelics, have to offer for society is putting the mystery back into religion. Um, I call it the entheogenic reformation. Um, I think that we're living in a time in the midst of uh, a rebirth of spirituality in the world. Uh, the problem we have in the Judeo-Christian tradition in the West is basically that we have a placebo sacrament. Religions founded on a placebo sacrament that have evolved a very complex uh, liturgy to defend against people having religious experiences. No long history of burning people for having their own religious experiences. Uh, the, the, the idea of religion is not uh, something that one has to approach with faith. Uh, what religion is about is giving you faith. And if you have a genuine sacrament in religion, uh, that gives you faith that you are in, have your place in the universe and that um, you are one with the other creatures on this planet. And it's become all turned around so that we have religions that require faith in, it, in what is called the doctrine of transubstantiation so that you will buy this program that, that um, the placebo is the sacrament. And uh, they lost all touch with the real root of, of spirituality. It's not a question in my mind. Many people often say, well, do drugs produce real religious experiences or genuine experiences of a religious sort, or is it merely artificial? I think rather the shoe is on the other foot. It's the uh, nothing could be more genuine and real as far as religious experience is concerned than the entheogenic experience, uh, the universal use of these substances in, in a shamanic context. It's really the wiser to turn the coin over. Uh, it's incumbent upon the proponents of other roots to religious ecstasy, ecstasy to demonstrate that those are valid or genuine. Uh, those seem to me to be the artificial ones. And the, the, the endogenic sacrament is the real thing. It's the real old time religion. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's what would happen. Uh, it is happening anyway. Uh, I don't think it's a question really of decriminalization. Uh, has anyone seen any evidence that the laws are stopping people from taking these mushrooms? I don't see any evidence of that at all. Uh, it's like catching waves on the shore or counting the grains of sand on the beach, stopping mushrooms from growing or people from collecting them. So, uh, generally speaking, I think that, that um, the laws aren't really standing in the way, especially where mushrooms are concerned, because they grow adventitiously all over the world. So, I'll, I'll cede the microphone to someone else. And, uh, I'd like to add on that, that I find, I, I love this country that I've grown up in, I, I was in the Army for it, and I feel very sad that I live in a country which likes to make criminals out of its citizens, and that disturbs me greatly. I, I personally, more on its own citizens. I personally don't like breaking the law, but I bend it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can say. And, and also that, you know, we uh, have a lot of things, like Jonathan said, they're all over the world. We cannot cement the earth. We're, we're doing that partially, but they'll be here for a long time. I think this uh, question that, uh, that he's asked, um, as Jonathan said, you know, it's not particularly dissuading anyone from from eating mushrooms or any of these other things. I and mean, I think the the most immediate benefit that it might have is to uh, maybe remove the burden somewhat from the from the legal system, and clog the courts with these uh, spurious cases. But um, what I want to not that mushrooms seem to be particularly under any kind of legal pressure. I mean, you know, they are technically illegal, but I don't see legions of people being put into jail for either growing or collecting mushrooms. But 
you know, I, I guess part of it is the government, you know, has the right to do this if they want to, because technically there are illegal and this sort of touches on an issue which I mulled over in my mind a lot, and I don't really have any answer. Um, but it seems to me that you know there's a lot of talk these days about how current approaches to the drug problem, quote unquote, the war on drugs and so on, is not working, and we need to look at some more creative solutions than just uh, put people in jail and impose mandatory sentencing and this sort of thing. But how do you do that? I mean, if you're going to Ill, if you're going to make drugs legal or decriminalize them, what do you do? Do you, do you make them legal across the board? I mean, can you can make it so that you can buy, go into the drugstore and buy crack or whatever. And, you know, again, I say I don't really have an answer, but it's, seen, it's, it's long seen to me that one possible solution to this conundrum or one possible way out is on a legal level to make a distinction between plants and drugs. Um, at what point does a plant become a drug? Well, I suppose when you ingest it uh, in order to become intoxicated. Uh, at the same time, it is true that the plant psychedelics and even other types of psychoactive plants, so opium, for example, and coca itself, you know, in the unrefined form, are fairly innocuous, or more innocuous certainly than the purified, refined substances. So I've, I've often, you know, if I could sit down at a table with Al Gore and some of the other people who are maybe concerned with this, this would be my suggestion. If the government could make a distinction between plants and drugs, and say plants, forget it. We're not interested. We're not going to set ourselves up. You know, we're one species on this planet, and we share the biosphere with all other plant and animal species. And you know, it, it's a human hubris, if you will. We can't set ourselves up and say, you know, we're going to make an effort to eradicate a species from the face of the earth. I mean, I have serious reservations whether even things like the smallpox virus. You know, terrible as it is, I mean, now we can actually eliminate the smallpox virus. And I have a serious question as to whether that's even a desirable thing. Uh, and the same argument in another, in this context, applies to the drug plants. I mean, well, fortunately, it's impossible to eradicate them from the earth because they are too economically important, whether the economy is underground or above ground. I mean, hemp is a good example. It's a, it's a cultivated plant that's good for lots of things. The hemp constituency can point out much better than I can what it's useful for. But I've often thought if the government wanted to develop a real solution to the drug problem, or an, maybe even an interim solution, if they said, if you want to cultivate mushrooms in your basement, in your backyard, if you want to grow weed in your backyard, if you want to grow opium, Fine, we don't care. You know, you can deal with plants, you can make tinctures, you can snort it, rub it on your bodies, whatever it is that, that you want to do. But when you start refining it down into purified white powders that you can inject, or otherwise that otherwise more lend themselves to abuse, you know, and we can debate endlessly what abuse means, um, then we're gonna frown on that, and that's where we're going to concentrate our efforts. But plants, you know, humans should have the right to form whatever symbiotic relationships with plants they wish to. No arguments here for that. <laughs> You know, as a person who is concerned with the, the right of people to do this and also concerned with the fact that, you know, under some circumstances these substances do have their dangers. So how do we, you know, steer that narrow course? This is one idea and I clearly there's agreement on it, but that's that's what I would say to that.
that. Uh, another point, too, is that a lot of these laws, laws are enacted as public health laws. And what I do in my own home is not public. And that's something the government has to start doing. Uh, <laughs> and, and about this idea of the illegalized implants. In the first case, it's obnoxious to the point of absurdity for humankind to presume to illegalize any organism. If any organism deserves to be illegalized on this planet, it's us. <laughs> and and when we're, what we're living through now is really the second war on drugs. The first war on drugs was fought in the, in the first half of the second decade of this century and won by the American Medical Association and the American Pharmaceutical Association, uh, in, in which um, a monopoly on, on uh, the sale of and dispensing of drugs was given to these uh, uh, non-governmental agencies. Um, unfortunately, when the Harrison Narcotics Act were, were going on 80 years of prohibition of, of drugs, it, it was actually enacted in December of 1914 and became law in March of 1915, the Harrison Narcotics Act, which is the basis for all of the drug control in the United States. And when, when that act was conceived, they only anticipated illegalizing two plants and later three when cannabis was added on. Uh, it was basically directed against cocaine, i.e. coca, and uh, morphine, heroin, i.e. opium pumps. And then by bureaucratic extension of the concept, once established in drug control, to the, the, the current absurd situation where we have uh, many dozens of controlled substances, and the inexorable advance of biochemistry, we now have a situation where perhaps 250 or 300, the number growing all the time, uh, plants are illegal, and it's a situation of what is called in, in, uh, in law constitutional vagueness. It's not immediately apparent to the general citizen, nor indeed to a specialist, just what is illegalized by, this law, by these laws. There are, uh, and since it involves plants that can grow adventitiously on anyone's property at any time, it's a, a, a matter of great concern. Um, uh, let <coughs> Let me add uh, a specific European view of this mushroom. Uh, for example, from Germany, uh, I know from no people any uh, legal problems with uh, the mushroom. Uh, the mushrooms were uh, out of the view of the, some media, and uh, you cannot find any articles or things about this. If you look to the law from, uh, I would say, Western Germany now, or Polish Germany, uh, you have, uh, for example, the in this law, but no uh, fungal material, and it, uh, it's a wide uh, case for the interpretation is this in the law or not. Uh, as I have written in my book, The Foolish Mushrooms, um, in East Germany before, uh, we have asked about the uh, legal status of some uh, salicybinic uh, mushrooms, and they have said to us there are no in the law, and uh, so we can put. Uh, study these mushrooms. And now, uh, as I have said, you can say uh, it is in it or not, but I know of no people with any problems. It's not so that uh, these mushrooms are widely cultivated. Uh, some people go into uh, some pastures and found the liberty caps and no other mushrooms. And some years ago in Switzerland, uh, the police have used some, some helicopters to look to the people who go uh, over the fields, but they have uh, failed this uh, practice and nobody uh, looked to this. Uh, mushroom seekers, as well as in England in the 70s, in some cases, people were prosecuted for the silence, if in other not, and uh, I have heard that uh, until now nobody looked to these mushrooms because they have more and true problems. And another thing is uh, that uh, if you would ask me what do you think about the mushroom, I think that they have a great value in the study of some psychological uh, disease, but also for some psychological uh, normal states because uh, you have a tool to go uh, into the uh, psychological conditions and for yourself you can look uh, what happens, what uh, Neurosis or trauma from the past. Uh, I have this uh, with a practical guide, and uh, this is the reason that uh, I must say 
I cannot uh, see a society in which all people, most people, will use this mushroom in future to, despite some uh, legal uh, conditions because this mushrooms and other uh, hallucinogens or antiogens or what could you say uh, go so deeply in, in the psychological uh, conditions that uh, some people say no it's not for me, it's better that I uh, know not so much about me or it, uh, some rock problems came out, <coughs> other people have a more uh, uh, inside view or some some from religious uh, conditions and uh, they said it's good for me but it's not I think it's not a, a class of substances to be in future uh, for all people um, because all people are different and this is the reason that um, not a true addiction can be prevailed mm -hmm. so. um, I like to add too that uh, a lot of these drug laws that were passed uh, to make a drug particularly illegal, it has to have no social acceptable medical value and it has to have a high potential for abuse. Uh, about 35 years ago, Timothy Leary showed at the Concord State Massachusetts Reformatory for Men that these mushrooms do really have social medical value and uh, used as a treatment as an adjuvant to psychotherapy and therapeutic medicine. Uh, as far as a high potential for abuse, if somebody does the mushrooms more times than they need to, the interesting effects slowly disappear as, as they go to tolerance to them and they don't do them for a while and don't do them again. If somebody has an unpleasant trip on the mushrooms, they just never do them again. So uh, a lot of the laws uh, are, uh, whether somebody does them or not, most people who do them really uh, disregard the law one way or the other. They don't care what the law is. And, and the law, on the other hand, isn't really involved with the mushrooms per se. That, the prohibitions are against the mushrooms morally, but the law is against the chemical substance psilocin and psilocybin. In New Zealand, uh, when all this American tactics caused other countries to pass their drug laws, New Zealand has banned uh, uh, for the possession, use, or sales of psilocybin cubensis and psilocybin mexicana. Neither one of those mushrooms grow in New Zealand. <laughs> In Florida, which has very heavy anti-pornography laws, anti-drug laws, anti-cocaine, anti-marijuana, if you're not a Christian, get out. Uh, psilocybin mushrooms are legal, <coughs> and this is an unusual situation there. And in Canada, I believe the famous philosophy mushroom at church was a uh, group of people who've been around since the early 70s, and uh, that they have the legal status to use psilocybin mushroom as a sacrament in their religion because uh, they formed their church and their charter before the law was changed, making the possession or use of the mushrooms illegal there. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, police generally look the other way. They don't have never really considered mushrooms to be a drug per se, as they do marijuana, cocaine, pill, speed, ash, or uh, any other kind of drug that somebody's prone to take. So there is a lax as far as the attitude goes. The federal law is the cultivation and growing of philosophy cubensis or all which uh, most people know about anyway. Exactly. It's specifically against the law. You guys have federal law, so I'll speak to them. We uh, seem to be witnessing uh, what appears to be a rising tide of violence in society. At the same time, many of us who tried these substances have remarked at the heart opening effect, the pathogenic effect, in my world. Uh, of these mushrooms. Uh, do any of you think that widespread use in society of these mushrooms might help us to mellow out a little bit? <laughs> well, um, about the, the violence, um, I would like to say something about that, but not necessarily pertaining to the mushrooms, and I'll comment on that. I think the, it's common to piss and moan and complain about violence in the media and um, newspapers and movies and television shows and so forth. I think the problem is that we live in a country where violence is the biggest business and in fact it's the only going business left as far as international trade goes. The U.S. weapons industry is what our government has chosen to uh, make an example of national excellence and indeed Americans make the best weapons in the world and um, all different times. But do we make the best cars, or the best steel, or the best uh, anything else? That's all up to question. And 
as long as the government persists not only in, in subsidizing and making that an industry the, the centerpiece of the national technical apparatus, but conducting repeated demonstrations of the, of the uh, utility of these weapons in third world countries uh, that don't have any way of defending themselves against them, uh, that creates a culture of violence. And uh, I believe that all the rest of it is a reflection of that. And uh, yes, I think indeed the use of these substances could help address that situation uh, and, and breed a more pacifist strain of citizen less willing to part with his tax dollar to support that kind of nonsense. Um, so I, I would, my answer to that would be yes, I think it could go a long way towards addressing uh, that problem and the problem of violence against nature in general, uh, the ecological damage that modern life uh, inexorably causes. Uh, and that's in my experience, certainly, it really um, does, the entheogenic experience really does militate against that type of violence. People who eat mushrooms are not violent. Yeah, Reasonable 